Welcome uh, to the National Museum of the Pacific War. My name is David Shields. I'm the Director of Education here at the museum. And this is our seventh webinar in a series dedicated to the 75th anniversary of the end of the Pacific War. Each one of the topics of the previous webinars had been based on a pivotal decision or an important event which occurred in that last year. We take a different turn on this particular webinar as we look at those people who were not playing combat roles. But as we share the so many of the stories here at the National Museum of the Pacific War, we did, didn't win that war just by the combatants. We won that war by an entire national commitment, which included men, women, and children, and people of all ages here at the home front. So today what we wanted to do, we wanted to focus on that group of people that sometimes were not under the great bright lights of fame uh, that we often see about in all the books that are written on this topic. So, what do we have today? Today we have Roman, Rona Simmons, who wrote a book back in April, actually it was published in April this year, called The Other Veterans of World War II, Stories from Behind the Front Lines. And this particular book looks at those individuals who played important roles. And along with Rona, we'll have two other important guests who will support her presentation with artifacts and firsthand accounts of that war. So, no one wants to hear anything more about me, so let me turn it over to you, Rona, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate uh, the Museum of the Pacific War conducting this series uh, as we approach the 75th anniversary of the end. I'm delighted to offer today a little different perspective, as you mentioned, by talking about a group of people that have rarely been in the spotlight. They're the non-combat veterans and a group I call the other veterans. These are 19 veterans that I interviewed uh, over the last several years. They are the men and women who serve behind the lines, some stateside, some feet from the action in Europe or the Pacific, and others halfway around the globe on the edge of the Gobi Desert. They're veterans who to a person would say they did nothing special. But by the time I'm through, I hope you'll see how special they actually are and why I chose to tell their story. Perhaps the best place to begin is with some iconic photos from World War II, photos that probably anyone interested in World War II is familiar with, whether it's the USS Arizona in flames after Pearl Harbor or the Bunker Hill in flames after a kamikaze attack near Okinawa. And the more triumphant pictures like George MacArthur wading ashore in the Philippines in 1944, or Joe Rosenthal's iconic picture of the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. But when you think about non-combat veterans, the others, you probably are, would be hard pressed to find photos of them. They're fewer and far between, or certainly a lot less well known. Um, and why is that, I asked a couple years ago. Is it because you think they're boring or maybe their roles were unimportant? After all, they were mechanics, ch chaplains, nurses, supply officers, and some might say or use the pejorative terms, grease monkeys, pencil pushers, uh, or um, desk jockeys. And I thought that was a very false image and I set out to prove otherwise. Um, so in, 19, in 2017, I wanted to find these veterans, but I thought they would be rather hard to find. After all, um, most of the stories we know in the pictures, as we've said, are, are from those who were in combat. And um, I looked at the numbers to help. Uh, at the top left of your screen, you'll see the 1940 US population was 133 million, about half of what we are today. And it was relatively evenly split between men and women. So we had 66 million men in the country. When the first peacetime draft uh, was instituted in October 1940, those between 21 and 35 uh, were required to register. And, and by the end of the war, the, all those between 18 and 65 were required to register. About 75% qualified out of that, of the 50 million who registered. And uh, what, what transpired is actually 16 million in the lower left of your screen ended up serving. So about 30% of the total of the 50 million who registered. 10 million of those were drafted and 6 million were vol volunteers. Now, um, the women were not eligible to be drafted nor could they actually volunteer to serve except in the Army and uh, Navy Nurse Corps up until about 1942. 
So you can see the representation of the women, the 400,000 women who made up part of the military. On the bottom left, the little pink legs on the icon. And of those 16 million who served over the course of the war, it turns out that 10 million came through combat and 6 million were non-combat. And there are, there's a variation on these numbers depending on your source, but I've seen numbers as high as one-to-one -one or even slightly more non-combat to combat. So my fears of not being able to find these uh, people to talk to were unfounded. The next thing I wanted to know before I got into uh, talking to the veterans was understanding how they were assigned to their positions. Uh, the military at the end of 1940 and really all the way through 1941, despite the draft, hardly moved the needle. Um, we, we were still at only 500,000 people in the military until Pearl Harbor. And on that day or just after, uh, men rushed the doors of the recruitment centers. Everyone wanted to volunteer and to join to serve their country. Um, to, to be sure, some volunteered because they realized that if they volunteered, they would have their choice of being in the Navy or Army Air Corps, um, and they could volunteer for those positions and have their choice as opposed to being assigned to the Army. And they were, as you might expect, very nervous about the Army. Um, they had heard the stories of their fathers, their uncles, cousins who had served in World War I in the trenches. And if they could volunteer, they hoped to avoid that experience. Many of them, had dreams of being a pilot. You can hardly talk to a veteran who doesn't admit that what he really wanted to do was fly. Flying was still in its infancy. These men had grown up adoring Charles Lindbergh and so wanting to be a part of the, the, a pilot in, in the military. It was still glamorous, it was exciting, and yes, a little bit dangerous. But shortly after standing in line, they learned one thing. That was, you're in the Army now, and the Army knows best. The Army had 550 positions to fill, uh, Army alone, and similar amounts in the Navy and, uh, and uh, uh, Army Air Corps. So they needed to be able to divert men because we, they knew they were trying to volunteer for the Navy and Army Air Corps, but they needed to fill positions. The idea was by directing people to positions that most closely mirrored their civilian occupations, they would be able to keep the training time down in the army and the morale up. So bricklayers, steel workers were directed to the Corps of Engineer, longshoremen to the Quartermaster Corps, police and detectives to a natural, the military police. But there were still many, many more positions to fill. Artists, bakers, my favorite, saddle and harness makers, because yes, at the beginning of World War II, we were still uh, using horsemen and cavalry. And pigeoneers, we were still sending some messages by pigeon. So um, I had other questions, and when I began to interview veterans, they helped me answer those. One of them was to try to explain why so many people rushed to serve. And Eleanor, Eleanor Milliken Fry, at the top of your screen, was the first lieutenant in the US Navy. She was the first in the first class of Navy waves. And fine upbringing in South Georgia and probably the most unlikely candidate to serve, but she said, I can't really explain to anyone living today why I joined. It was a different time back then and people had a different mindset. Everyone just did anything they could to support their country. I also wondered whether the non-combat veterans um, were looked down upon or heard negative comments about them not being um, doing what they could for this country. And I found that also not to be true. Um, Randy Bostwick, a captain in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, uh, assured me that he never heard a disparaging remark about anyone being in a non-combat position. And then I asked sort of the opposite question. Well, what about you as soldiers? Were you feeling like you weren't doing all that you could? And um, Howard King, who was a, a messman in Pensacola, Florida, and later a steward in the Philippines, told me that at one point he wanted to volunteer to be as part of the submarine corps. And he went to his boss asking for a transfer. And his boss said, thought about it and said, well, Howard, um, sort of echoing a statement by attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte, you know, an army crawls on its belly. He said, what's more important than food? And Howard thought about that for a moment and decided 
actually, he couldn't think of anything to answer that. So he stayed in and as I said, served uh, as a steward in first class in the Philippines. And I also, um, the, at the bottom of the screen, James K. Nalen uh, was a corporal with the US Army Air Forces. And he was one of those who had wanted to be a pilot. And he said he did have second thoughts along with others in his group. And that he was concerned that they were not doing all that they could. But when he was in England and uh, he was a, machine, a mechanic with the, um, uh, on a P-38 for the Army Air Corps, uh, he said, when the first casualties came back from the front lines, some soldiers without an arm or a leg or with other serious injuries, all those thoughts disappeared. They were more than relieved. They were thankful. So um, it's really great to have their words and be able to get those answers firsthand. Now, um, the 19 people I interviewed, I was very fortunate. Uh, this is, I found them by word of mouth and uh, through, through friends, through networking, different World War II societies. They were just 19, a very, very small fraction of the 16 million who served. But by luck, um, I found them from all major branches and theaters of war. So the Europe on the right of your screen, across the United States and uh, in the Pacific and Asia. They represented the Army, Army Air Forces, the Navy, the Waves, the Army Nurse Corps, Merchant Marine, Civil Air Patrol, the Saco Navy, and the Manhattan Project. It's from talking to them that I learned probably the most important thing about the non-combat soldiers. And that is that they were very passionate about their service. Uh, even though they didn't get their first choice in most cases, they decided that they, they were not disappointed and they were, didn't refuse to serve. They sort of doubled down. They decided to execute their duties really with a passion and perfection that is really an astonishing thing. So um, I'm, I'm going to share just a couple of stories with you so that you can get a better feel for the details. Uh, the first is William Schneiderwin. He's a first lieutenant in the US Army. And when I met him in 2017, he said, I was a really naive 13 year old. I prayed for the war to continue so I could lead a platoon into battle. That was his dream, and it was just after the war started. So he was, uh, in 1941, 13, he had several years to wait before he would be able to enlist. But as soon as he was able, which was the spring of 1945, he got his, he was only 17, but he got his parents to sign his enlistment papers. As he said, um, was famous for saying, you make your luck, you don't wait for luck to come to you, sort of echoing um, an, a, another statement of um, you, you make, I'm um, sorry, you're, the best luck you make is the luck you make yourself. He um, was not only lucky by being able to enlist before the end of the war, but he was also smart and he qualified for the ASTP program, that is the Army Specialized Training Program. It was a uh, program the Army instituted to produce as many officers as they could before the, uh, at the start of the war. And um, what they did was promise in an 18 month program that people could finish basic training, get a college degree and earn their commission. And it was, um, it was a prestigious program. Not only did you have to have high scores on the aptitude test, but it was also one that people like Henry Kissinger, Ed Koch, Kurt Vonnegut, among many and many other people participated in. But um, just after he started school at Rutgers, he also learned another lesson from the Army, that is the Army changes its mind often and frequently without much notice. They reneged on the program and pulled people from the ASTP. In his case, they sent him to Fort Benning, um, a, a school that also had a very um, high, was held in very high regard. Eisenhower, Patton, Bradley, and over 200 other generals uh, spent time at various points in their career at Fort Benning. Bill was part of the information and education program there, and it was something he said was a plum job. And I found that very hard to understand until I really talked with him at length about it. What he said was that um, he had, as I said, wanted to lead a platoon into battle, and this was as close as he was going to come he was going to lead a platoon of students from the head of a classroom. 
it was important to him uh, to communicate what the soldiers were going to be doing and why they were going to be doing it. In fact, there were concerns at the start of the war that our soldiers, American soldiers, would not be able to compete against the uh, soldiers from totalitarian regimes. And um, that was George Marshall essentially put that story to rest. He said, not only did he believe that our soldiers could compete, but they would be equal to or better than the totalitarian soldiers if they knew why they were, um, why they were fighting, if they were given the answers as to what America was trying to accomplish. So um, Bill, as I said, decided to do that and was passionate about it. In fact, after his brief stint at Rutgers, which he would go back to and graduate from, he had decided to be a social studies teacher. Um, the information and education program was a bit maligned for a while, and even the New York Times sent a reporter down to Fort Benning to find out whether it was um, really of, of any value. And the reporter ended up attending one of Bill's classes and discovered and quoted him later in the article in the Times that in fact it was very worthwhile, the soldiers supported it because one man, the right man, the reporter said, could make a difference. Now Bill um, followed that up later by eventually being transferred to the Army of Occupation in Japan at the end of the war. And he arrived just shortly after the bombings, was able to tour Nagasaki and actually speak to a number of the soldiers, uh, the Japanese soldiers and civilians that were hospitalized. Consummate professional that he was and someone well-schooled in the social studies of the time, he talked to them, never apologizing, but helping to explain why we were there and why we had done what what we had done with the bomb. The second story I want to share is a very different one. Uh, it is of Jack Coyle, a radio man first class with the Saco Navy. He was in the Navy, but he said, I was a sailor in the Navy. I walked, rode horses, drove jeeps, rode sampans, flew in planes, but I never served on a ship. And he's pictured at the top here holding a very young child who is his son, Jack Coyle, whom you'll be meeting in just a few minutes. But Jack um, was very highly educated in his group in the Navy. Uh, he had completed law degree before he enlisted, but he was, had been assigned to a desk job and he was very bored. And so he did something that we all know is not something you do. He raised his hand for a top secret assignment. They sent him to China, of all places, with the Saco Navy, Saco being the Sino-American Cooperative Organization, and maybe more popularly known as the Rice Paddy Navy. It still was uh, a top secret and hardly unknown um, back in, in the days of the war, and still very um, uh, few people know about Saco Navy today. But 3,000 Americans were in the group, and they operated behind the lines in China. They were deep into China as Japan had um, control of the Chinese ports and many of the routes in and out of China. And we were sort of blind to what was going on there. And we sent these people in to gather intelligence, to look at troop movements by the Japanese and to intercept weather forecasts. Uh, both of these items were then relayed to the Pacific fleet. We, we probably can't fathom a day uh, today why weather forecasts were important, but uh, back then, if the fleet were operating uh, and planning an operation in the, in the Pacific and didn't know whether the next day was going to have good weather or bad weather, these forecasts from Japan uh, helped immensely. It was a, a relatively dangerous job. There was, in fact, a bounty on the heads of all 3,000 Americans. The, Chinese knew, the, the Japanese knew that these men were in China, but they took extraordinary means. They never wore their uniforms. They didn't salute. They ate, lived with their hosts and tried to blend in as, as much as possible. And as I said, um, he finished his duty, came home. And there is one thing, um, you can see a picture of a number of, of uh, letters on the screen. Jack's uh, wife saved um, over 200 letters from her husband. And so I was able to read all of these with Jack Coyle Jr.'s uh, permission. They were very interesting and maybe because he had played a little role in intelligence, he and his wife had agreed to a code 
because it was prohibited for soldiers to disclose in it to their family, uh, to friends that they wrote, uh, where they were serving, uh, what they were doing. And so before he left for the Pacific, and as he was leaving California, he sent letters and he and his wife had somehow agreed on when she would know that he was sending a coded message. In certain letters, she circled the first letter of each word in a sentence. And in one, she, he spelled out in Perth, Australia. And in a letter a few weeks later, it said in Calcutta. So she was able to follow him through uh, his journeys and in, into China where he eventually served. Now, um, I hope that gives you just a taste. Uh, these are just two of the 19 and the 19, as I said, are just 19 of 6 million. But they filled out many, many roles. And uh, I hope this gives you a better appreciation for some of the things they did. I love to find the quote from George Patton, someone we look at as um, a hero in the, in the, and a strategist in combat fighting. But he too appreciated these people's roles. He said, all of the real heroes are not storybook combat fighters. Every single man in this army plays a vital role. So with that, I'm going to say it's been my honor and privilege to share these stories uh, uh, of those who are still remaining living that I've interviewed. We've become fast friends. Um, but many, many stories remain to be told. There are today less than 400,000 of the 16 million who served in World War II that, who are living with us. Their stories will vanish if we all don't do something to help. You, of course, can help by writing someone's story, whether it's a friend, friend or a complete stranger. Or you can connect a veteran to one of the many agencies that uh, work for the Veterans History Project. And the Museum of the Pacific War has its own unit called the Nimitz Education and Research Center, which Chris McDougall is going to tell you more about. Thank you. Thank you, Rona. Um, Again, my name is uh, Chris McDougall. I am the director of the archives and library here at the museum. Uh, my department uh, basically is the Nimitz, and Edu Nimitz Education and Research Center. And within the Nimitz Education and Research Center, we have an oral history program. The uh, oral history program has been around since the late 1980s here at the museum, and we, to date, we have more than 5,000 uh, recorded interviews. Over half of those are available in our online repository, and I am the point of contact for the program. Um, our interviewers are all volunteers, and we are interested in hearing from uh, any veteran, um, who saw combat or not, or who was uh, any individual who was at the home front during the war. And uh, we have the ability to record by phone if that's uh, the preferred method. Um, we would be anxious to uh, record anyone out there if uh, uh, anybody knows of, of somebody that uh, fits that uh, criteria, uh, please let us know and uh, let us uh, help record history. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. And first, let me thank you too, Rona. That was really, really interesting. Um, thank you. And I like what you said at the very end when you were talking about, uh, you talked about 19 of 6 million people who served in a non combatant role. And yet, each one of those people's roles in the war were important. And I sometimes think that here when we ch share our stories from our museum, people assume that to be a leader, to be a hero, you have to do some great thing that's written about or photographed or talked about. But the reality is every day we can be a hero and do something important that helps all of us. And I think that's how your book speaks to me. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay, well, Chris, uh, we're going to come back to you. Uh, you certainly have some things to share with us, which uh, I think is very, very interesting. But firstly, let's go to Jack Coyle. Uh, Jack has some things he's going to share uh, from his dad's service in the war. And as you can see from Jack's hat, uh, he's also the historian for the Sino-American Cooperative Organization. And Jack, before I turn it over to you, I've got to tell you, I was joking with some of the people here in our little studio 
uh, I can still see the resemblance of you in your little picture with your dad. I can still see it. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir, sir. So go ahead. We're very interested in seeing some of the things you can share with us today. Okay. Um, I'm Jackson Coyle, by official name, but I didn't like it, so I went by Jack. And it's interesting that dad's 5'7", and I'm 6'3". So when they call, is Jack there? Which one? Tall Jack. Okay. Anyway, as, as it was said, uh, my dad was in SACO, the Sino-American Cooperative Organization. And how he got there, as, they, as Rona said, he, he volunteered for it after he got his law degree. He wanted to get uh, an ensign uh, commission and his law professors and everything sent everything into the Navy and he waited six months and didn't hear anything. So that's when he uh, went in as a enlisted man. He was a radio operator, first class. And his main site was in uh, Cumming, which is right outside of the 14th Air Force, where their headquarters was. And the radio station there had so much power, it could go directly to Washington, D.C., which is none of the other radio stations could do that. How SACO was organized, uh, Mary Miles, Milton Miles, but he goes by Mary, he was in the Navy, uh, started in about 1917, and then he was discharged to accept appointment at the U.S. Naval Academy. He graduated and at the grade of ensign, uh, ensign in June of 1922. And after he graduated, he was sent to China on a five-year tour and later had another tour in China, which lasted three years. In fact, he was over there while the Chinese were getting bombed and the Japanese were fighting like crazy. One instance, uh, when he came back to the United States, his family was over there with him, his wife and three kids, and they decided to go back through China, the Burma Road, through India, through Pakistan, and then in Greece, they got a ship to come back to the United States. And he came the recorder in the uh, area where they do research on what the Navy needs. One of his friends that he met uh, was Major Sano Sin Yu, who was the Chinese embassy attache throughout the war. They became excellent friends. And so when the war started, Admiral King called him into the office, his office, and said, uh, he says, Miles, I got a job for you. And Miles wanted to be a back in the destroyer. He says, nope, you're going to China again. And I want you to go up and down the coast and see where we could possibly land in three to four years, set up weather stations so you can get the weather to not only the fleet, but also to General uh, Claire Chenault's 14th Air Force. Also, uh, we want you to put coast watchers up and down the coast. All the people in the field wore the civilian Chinese uh, garb, shall we say. They learned how to walk like the Chinese. They had yo-yo poles with baskets on each end where they could, where they could put their uh, food and also put, sorry about that. I unplugged that, but I don't know what happened. Anyway, put their food, ammunition, weapons and everything else in, uh, wore the, the triangle hats, and they took the malaria medicine, which 
turn their skin yellow. So if you pull the hat down, that you could not see who it really was. Now we had a couple in there that were blonde and six four, and you don't see very many Chinese that are six four. I said after Admiral King said, I want you to go to China, uh, set up the Coast Watchers radio stations, and just basically do what you can against the Japanese. He said, you will report to General Dai Li. Well, Dai Li was General Chiang Kai's chef, head uh, general, and they made an agreement, they call it friendship agreement, where uh, between the United States and China, and after Miles and uh, Dai Li got together and talked about it, they said, we need a formal, formal uh, relationship and agreement. And that's when the SACO uh, agreement was made. It was made and it was sent to Washington. It was approved by FDR. It was approved by Marshall and all the way down the line. And the agreement said General Dai Li will be the commander of SACO and Miles will be the deputy commander. Now SACO consisted of Americans and also Chinese. Uh, they sat side by side they fought side, side by side. And as Rowan said, they had a uh, bounty on their head. Admiral Miles was uh, tried to be killed about four times and Dai Li uh, about three times. So when he got to, he got, he got Shaw Dai Li, uh, Dai Li, and him, Dai Li said, uh, what you need to do? He said, I would like to go down the coast. So he, Dai Li and Miles, and an attache from the embassy there in China, they took off down to the coast and looked to see what they could do. That's when they started putting in the radio stations, the weather stations and, and things like that. We had 2,500 to 3,000 men in Saco. They ranged from the Gobi Desert and they rode horses, Saco did. Down to Indochina and from India all the way to the coast of China. So you can imagine trying to get supplies and everything else was very difficult because Stillwell, General Stillwell, controlled the, all the supplies coming in and uh, they didn't get what they needed. Later, uh, the OSS wanted to get in China as an intelligence group. Uh, General MacArthur was in charge of the whole Pacific and he didn't want them in there. Well, General uh, Donovan, uh, he, unknown to Miles, got Miles appointed as a South of uh, the OSS director. He, Miles didn't know about it for about four months. And Dai Li had spies all over the world. I mean, literally, he had spies in the Japanese palace uh, most of the policemen uh, in all the towns were his spies. He had uh, pirates, Chinese pirates that went up and down the coast fishing. They were intelligent spies. And uh, so between the two of them, they knew what was happening in China. In fact, one time when Miles uh, was in, in uh, India, uh, he got off the train and all of a sudden somebody hit him from the back 
and he turned around and slugged the gentleman. Uh, he, the gentleman cut his tongue off and stabbed Miles. Luckily, it was just a, a wound, not severe. Well, he picked up the tongue. When he got back, he told Dai Li what happened. And Dai Li, uh, within uh, about two weeks, found the person. All of his uh, intelligence people found he was a uh, Korean sympathizer with the Japanese. It was a volunteer unit. And you had to have at least two different specialties to get in that. The, some of them later became what they call scouts and raiders. They went to Fort, uh, she, it's down in Florida. Anyway, uh, and, and that down there, uh, they taught uh, how to sneak in with, with their men into the beach and you know, how to blow up ships and stuff like that. And the scouts and raiders, most of them ended up in, in India and couldn't get flights over before the war ended. Now, there's some things I want to show you. One thing, I don't know if you ever heard of a blood chit. A blood chit was something that looks like this. And you can see what it basically says in Chinese that I'm an American and I'm, a, I'm here to help China to win the war. Please get me back to friendly forces and you will receive an award. That one I showed you was one of our Sako men's uh, blood chip. This one here is a blood chip. Basically it says the same thing, but if you notice down at the bottom here, it's got a number on it. All the men that had blood chips had a special number. The 14th Air Force also had these. Uh, Sacco had 150 men assigned to General Chenault. Uh, Chenault's men were flying over to Hump, and it was very difficult to get over to Hump into coming. And they had to fly between the mountains. So Sacco set up an oxygen plant in India, and that way they'd fill their tanks up and so they could fly over the mountains instead of through them. Later, uh, they put a liquid oxygen uh, tanks uh, and filled the tanks from liquid oxygen, flew those over to hump so they would have oxygen coming back. Here's some of the patches that Sako had. This patch here, I hope you can see it pretty well. That was the patch, one of the patches my dad had on one of his, on his uniforms. It shows the Chinese flag and American flag. Interesting, it's got the Chinese flag on the left side. This was designed and made in China uh, when they started making these. If you notice, the United States, if they have something like this, they always have the American flag on the left. But since this was a Chinese unit, uh, the Chinese flag was on the left. Now at the bottom of it, you see a little pennant, triangle. It's got question mark, question mark, question mark, explanation, ex explanation, explanation, and star, star, star. That is a pennant that was made for Admiral Miles before the war started. And oops, this is another view of uh, not the complete pennant because there is about 14 feet. And you wonder what that means. Well, Miles asked his wife uh, before the war, 
how do you say certain bad words in the paper? And they said, well, you know, they use different symbols. So they came up with this, and that stands for what the hell. And that became the Sapos uh, pennant for all their areas. All the pilots and a lot of the Sako men had maps of China. This is one, they're made out of silk, so you don't have to worry about them. Uh, they last forever. And I got a complete set of China and also of uh, uh, Indochina. Those maps weren't the best in the world, but that's about all they had. One of the wars that Sako men received was what they call the Sako medal. Here it is. That medal is the, the most rare World War II medal there is. And they have different symbols up here. You can see the clasping hands with each other and the United States and the Chinese flag. ROC flag. If you can find these, they'll go from up to $2,000. That's how rare they are. With the metal, they get a, a certificate with that metal, and it's signed by a general. Uh, we are very close to the Chinese in Taiwan. They are brothers. And we, we go over there uh, about every three to five years at the host of the Military Intelligence Bureau, which is what Dai Li was in charge of during the war. In fact, I was over there in September this year. And if you look on the back here, you'll see my dad's hat on top. You can't see it very well, but those are the medals he's got, including the China War Memorial Medal. That medal came from the, uh, when they went into one of the towns in the Marco Polo Bridge and killed a lot of the Chinese and that honors that town, the civilians that died, and it was only given to members that had at least 30 days actually stationed in China. We had a lot of people in, in India, they couldn't get them. Uh, 1975, the 14th Air Force had a reunion in Mrs. Chiang Kai-shek came over to that reunion and awarded 200 of those medals to them. And most of our uh, Sako people have those now as well. Before, before dad left the United States, uh, he went to San Diego. And the USO had a place over there that you could take and they could make a, uh, the vinyl record and sent it back home. And this is the one that my dad made and uh, sent it to, to my mom. My dad said, I walked as a Navy man over a thousand miles when I was in China. And the reason being, they didn't have very many vehicles, one. Two, there wasn't very many roads where they needed to go. And you don't want a military vehicle setting, setting in a uh, outpost or a camp where the Japanese can fly over and see it. So they walk most of the time or sandpans. Uh, any way they could get around. 
And the last thing I want to talk about is what we call the last battle, naval battle of World War II. On August 14th, 45, uh, Japan actually, that was when they, when they surrendered. Words went out to all the SAFO people to go here, 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 along with their Chinese SAFO members. And one of the units, I think it was Camp 4, uh, went and hired two Chinese junks, or sailboats, as they call them sometimes, to take them to Shanghai. On the way down, uh, all of a sudden they saw a huge Japanese ship. And so the Americans had their, raised their U.S. flag. Next thing they knew, the, the 75 millimeter cannon that they had started firing at the two junks. One junk, the rudder was knocked out. The other junk went through the rigging and uh, kind of tore the rigging up. Well, the Americans backed off. The Chinese crew that owned the junk, they jumped down into the, into the inside of the junk and Sako guys never sailed a junk before, but they got everything repaired and took off after the uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese junk. When they caught up to it, uh, they started firing bazookas, Tommy guns, and everything else they had. It happened to have a uh, ammunition on the uh, Japanese junk, and one of the uh, bazooka rounds hit midships and got the uh, ammunition started exploding. Well, that put a big, big cloud around it and the Japanese couldn't fire anymore because they didn't know where the Americans were. They came along the side and boarded the Japanese junk. They find out out of the 90 people, 45 were killed all of them, the rest of them, all except four were injured. The captain of the junk presented the sword to uh, the captain of Sako. And it went to Admiral Miles, and then it went to Admiral King. I happened to find that sword. And it had a, had a reason I know it was Miles, because Miles, you can't see it very well, but that's the business card of Miles, and he wrote what happened, and also on the back is his Chinese name. And that was at the bottom of the scabbard. And this is the scabbard and sword that the gentleman gave our captain. There's also an indication that went to Admiral King's museum, and who knows how it got out of the museum, and luckily I found it. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. That was very interesting. You, you showed so many different types of artifacts, which is a uh, real connection to our museum. If we have some time, uh, I don't know if some of our viewers going to put in some questions, but there are certainly some questions we have here if we don't see them pop up on our chat screen. But first, let me thank you very much for that very uh, detailed presentation. But I want to go to Chris McDougall, who is our own archivist here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. He works, spends a lot of his time in the Nimitz Education Research Center. And that's where we have a repository of all kinds of very unique information, uh, not just the stories, but actual physical uh, examples of things from the war. And so, hey, I see you there, Chris. Thank you very much for joining us. Would you mind sharing with us something that you brought in today uh, that supports this story? Well, it'll be my pleasure. Um, what I've got to share today is uh, some uh, information in a photo related to uh, Mr. Charles Sawin. Uh, Charles was a uh, women's swim coach um, before the war. Uh, he had a national championship team 
And uh, when war broke out, he attempted to join the military, uh, but he wasn't accepted because he had a metal plate in his hip. Um, in 1945, he was contacted by the army um, because of his uh, skills as a, as a coach to uh, train B-29 bomber crews uh, to uh, swim. Uh, at that time, um, the uh, Army Air Force was ramping up its bombing effort uh, against uh, Japan, and um, they were uh, bringing in more and more B-29s uh, to make those attacks. And uh, because of the vastness of the Pacific Ocean, if uh, anything uh, happened to the aircraft, it was hit by an aircraft fire or uh, attacked by fighters or there was a mechanical failure, uh, chances are that those aircraft would have to uh, ditch in the ocean. So they uh, needed to learn how to swim. And uh, uh, they brought in Mr. Sawin. Uh, he trained those crews in uh, Hawaii. Um, at Schofield Barracks uh, on Oahu. Uh, they paid him at a lieutenant colonel rank. And what I've got here is a, uh, a photo of him. Um, I don't know how well you can see, but he's over here on the on this side here. The, the gentlemen that are, are with him in the photo um, were, were helping him train the crews. Uh, this collection came to us last year and uh, matter of fact, that image is gonna be featured in our uh, museum calendar, uh, which will be coming out in the near future. But um, that's what I have right now. Uh, Mr. Solon uh, made a, a great effort to, to try to join, unfortunately couldn't, but um, they were able to use his skills in the army. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, I remember seeing that picture of those uh, guys swimming. Our calendar theme next year is it took a whole nation to win the war where we focus on everyone, young people, older people, uh, because it took a nation sacrificing to make that war uh, uh, winnable. And so I remember seeing that photograph. So thank you all very much. I know we're running out of time. Actually, no, we still got about five minutes. So what I would like to do is I would like to open up all of our panelists uh, to any questions that might uh, be coming through from our chat line. While those questions come through, I, I did want to make one comment which I thought was kind of interesting. You know, when um, uh, Jack showed, uh, little Jack, <laughs> when he showed uh, that symbol of the question marks and exclamation marks, I thought that is so funny because when you think about younger people today, use so many shortcuts in talking when they email or text and that sort of thing. And they do a lot of that. And it's so funny to, to realize that we were doing that over 75 years ago. And that's part of the fun thing about being at a museum and sharing these stories is that we can connect. It's not as if, sometimes I think the, um, the clothes that people wear or the medium that we use to show off each other, being black and white or something like that, creates an excessive sense of distance or difference from each other, but the realities were the same. And so it's fun seeing that example that you showed with us today about how we are so similar to one another. But um, let's see, do we have some questions? Um, so, uh, someone asked about that sword. Could you tell me a little bit more about the sword, uh, Jack? Um, yeah, uh, I, the sword itself and the, the scabbard was what they typically had for a captain of a, of a vessel. And the, the, what they did to surrender was give that sword scabbard to whoever came aboard that was going to take over the vessel. Okay, okay, it's very ceremonial. I, I remember seeing yes. something like that on, uh, I think it's the, um, oh, what was it called? It was a Russell Crowe film, uh, uh, Commander, uh, yeah, I, I forgot the name of the film, but when in the 18th century and the 19th century, when a ship was taken over by a different commander, they would offer their sword or skiver for, uh, a ceremonial token of surrender. So it's very interesting. Uh, I have a question for you, Rona, um, that also popped in from another, uh, from a text actually. Uh, the question was asking you, what do you hope that people will take away most from reading your book? It's Master and Commander.
Rona, I think you're on mute. There we go. Is that better? <laughs> I'm on now. Um, well, I think the thing is to recognize that um, it, it's not just those in combat who um, were needed to wage the war, to win the war. They relied so much on the people behind them. And despite what you might think, they were very grateful for them, thankful that they were there. They could not have done what they did without them, whether it was uh, truck drivers that brought fuel, the messmen that brought food, um, the uh, uh, one, of, one of the women in the book is from the Manhattan Project. So um, everyone contributed. And I think I go back to Eleanor Milliken's words. Uh, it was a different time and place, but everyone did what they could for their country. And I hope people realize that. And as I try to do, uh, if I see a veteran, I stop them and I ask, tell me what you did. And you would, you would, you'll see how delighted they are to share their stories. So uh, that's a wonderful sentiment. And that's something that I think that we recognize as well. Speaking of that continuation of remembering the people from the Second World War, our next webinar will be on the atomic bomb, and that will come in August. So please uh, stay tuned as we provide more information on that upcoming webinar. In the meantime, thank you all so very, very much. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to share your insights and your special connection to this story, and I wish you all a very nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye-bye.